Good morning. Some of you know me, some don't. My name is Scott Pape. My lovely bride, Miss Cindy, sitting over there. Um, I haven't done this for a while, so I'm a little rusty. So hopefully when uh, we get started, the rust will wear off and we'll get going. It's a little bit about me. I'm not normal. I mean, I'm not the normal person up here. <laughs> the, these are big shoes to fill. And, um, you know, I stood here thinking, how do I stand here and do this? But it'll work. I want to start off by getting our minds set. I want to talk about us being theocentric instead of anthropocentric. I want to start by us thinking God-centered instead of man-centered. From the day that we're born until the day that we die, we spend every second with ourself. I have never been away from myself. And so it's easy to be self-centered and self-focused. It's by nature. Oh, you messed that one up. It also makes it hard for us to grasp the things of God because what we do a lot of times <clears throat> is that is we think of the things of God from a man-centered view, and when we do that, it makes certain things in the Scriptures extremely hard to understand, extremely hard to even accept. And so, I want us to be God-focused. Set yourself aside. Because if we're, if we're man-focused, self-focused, some of the things that we'll even look at today we will look at as not fair. And we've got to fight against that. And a lot of times, <clears throat> we will tend to discard certain doctrines or ignore them, or worse, we twist them in order to make it fit into our own way of thinking. Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to turn there. It has a ton of those doctrines in it. And I'd like to dive in. It's hard. It's hard to preach a topical sermon because you got to set the context first. And a lot of times it takes time to set context. We're going to spend half of our time just setting context. Ken's long winded. I can get that way too. So. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 3. I'm just going to read this one, we're going to read one sentence from chapter, from verses 3 through 14, okay? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to a dispensation suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, 
to the end that we who were first who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory in him you also after listening to the message of truth the gospel of our salvation having also believed you were sealed in him with the holy spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory let's pray Lord, how can we thank you enough when we read things like this and realize how great a blessing that we have being in Christ? Our hearts should overflow with joy and praise and honor for you. We pray that today, as we tackle a little bit of this, you'll open our eyes. You'll make a simple man like me be able to explain difficult things that you've written and that we would understand and it would make our hearts love you even more. We pray it for your glory and for your name's sake. Amen. In verse 3, Paul says, we have been blessed. He, He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Blessings from the blessed one. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. In Christ. The word every blessing, it means all of them. Every one of every kind. Nothing missing. We've been blessed with everything heavenly in Christ. Are you encouraged yet? Are you awake? Okay. Now, if you haven't done it, we, I was at the Young Disciples group on Friday, <clears throat> and I told everyone, if you haven't done this yet, at the end of verse 3, if you've got a Bible to write in, write I-E, and then write an arrow pointing down to verses 4 through 14. Because verses 4 through 14 tell us what those blessings are in Christ, okay? Okay? They elaborate on what those blessings are. And it is one long sentence full of clause after clause after clause. He states, or he starts, with the blessing. People don't think of it this way, okay? He starts with the blessing of God's unconditional selection of who he saves. He starts with election, which is one of those things that if you don't think of it in a God-centered way, you'll have difficulty with it. He starts with unconditional election. This selection of whom he saves. Do we decide who gets saved? We don't. If, If I decided who gets saved... This place would be a mess. God chose us in Christ before he created anything, which is hard for us to understand. He didn't look down through the quarters of time. He didn't look down and see that any of you would believe. And then he said, I'll choose that one because they'll believe. It doesn't work that way because he says he chose us, not we chose him. Did he have to choose us? No. Are you glad he chose you? Me too. As I said at the uh, the Young Disciples, I don't know why he chose me, but I ain't knocking it. 
Sometimes people look at this and say, well, this isn't fair. If anybody ever tells you that, tell them this. According to whose standards? According to your standards, maybe it's not. But according to God's standards, this is fair. You know what's not fair? He chose you. He chose me. That's not fair. But he did. Would you call that a blessing? Election? Good. Amen. Me too. You better, because it's one of our blessings. The next blessing that he talks about is God predetermining when, how, and through whom he would save us. Can you save yourself? No. Would you even seek God if he didn't intervene? No. I like to turn to Bible passages, so turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. We always end up in Romans, don't we? Beginning of verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Paul is quoting Psalm 14. And in the old Hebrew text, when he says there's none who understands, there's none who are righteous, there are none who seek God, he's literally saying it doesn't even add up to one. Put that in context, folks. From Adam, the first man, to whoever the last man is or woman is on earth, and everybody in between, billions, trillions of people, maybe not trillions, billions of people, if you put all of them together, it doesn't even add up to one. Are you encouraged? It doesn't even add up to one. None seek for him. There's none who are righteous. There's none who understand. So we won't seek him out. He had to intervene. God chose. Some people get election and predestination mixed up and think it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. God chose. He, he elected before creation. And in order to make his election come to pass, he set into motion predestination. It's that easy. Predestination is God's way of making sure that the elect get saved. Would you call it a blessing? Me too. He then goes on to say, to tell us about the blessing of becoming God's adopted children. We, through His redemption, become His adopted children. We become part of His family. Everything that Christ has by divine right almost lost it there. Everything that Christ has by divine right, we have by divine grace. He adopts us. We become His children. We become part of His family completely with all of the rights and privileges and responsibilities of being part of God's family. We take on His name. We wear His name. We bear His name to a lost and dying world as part of His family. 
we can now, we can now approach God the Father as Abba, as Papa, as Daddy. The, the transcendent God who is so absolutely other than what we are, who is untouchable, who is out of reach because of His complete holiness is now imminent. He's now safe. He's now intimate. He's now daddy. We become his adopted children as a blessing from him. As adopted children, we must live up to our new identity because we're saints. We're set apart from the world and set apart from sin. I put it on my left. And set apart to God. Leave that behind. Face God all the time. If you turn your back on Him, turn back around. It's not worth going back. On that old self, as, we, as I've, I've said before, that old self, put a sign on there that says, No fishing allowed. And don't go back and fish for that stuff. It's not worth it. We need to live up to our new identity. We're adopted children in Christ. We're in Christ. Is that a blessing? You bet it is. He goes on to talk about the blessing of salvation by God's unearned and undeserved favor, grace. We have to remember, there are no merits. There's only demerits until we come to Him. Here in Romans, look at Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. We all know this. We learned this in Awana. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. We are saved as a gift. Is that a blessing? It is a blessing. Paul then tells us our salvation involves redemption from the slave market of sin through Christ's blood. Christ traded His perfect, sinless, holy life for our wormy, worthless lives. That's not fair. Redemption is supposed to be something traded of equal value. When I grew up as a kid, we had things called uh, S&H green stamps. Uh, some of you might not know what those are. You, be glad you don't. My, if I got in trouble, mom would say, go sit in the table and lick the stamps. And <laughs> so I'd sit and lick stamps and stick them in. But we would get those every time we'd go to the grocery store, and we would save them up and, until we, we had enough of equal value of those stamps to trade in for something at the, what they called the redemption center. But, the thing is, is with our redemption, Christ trades in perfection for worthlessness. That's not fair. With that in mind, Applicationally, should we continue to make it look like it wasn't a fair trade? Absolutely not. We should try to live holy lives before Him because of what He's done. 
not to get favor, but because of what he's done for us. Continuing to live a life characterized by sin is a slap in the Redeemer's face. He purchased us. He purchased us with his blood. Would you call that a blessing? Me too. With that redemption and that adoption, we then have forgiveness of our sin, past, present, and future. God doesn't hold our sin against us. You're in Romans? Go over to Romans chapter 6. In Romans 5, he talks about Christ paying this penalty for sin, for his enemies. And some people, when they see this forgiveness thing of our sin is forgiven past, present, and future, they say, well, that then means that it doesn't matter if I sin. Paul anticipated that. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And the Greek words, I'm a Greek weirdo, you guys. The Greek words are meganoita. Meganoita, which, cut, which means this. Me is the word not, no. Genoita is a compound word that, me, that, that comes from genesis, which means beginning. We get our word genesis from it. And, and um, oita, or oidas, which is our mind. When you put those two together, along with this negation, Meganoita, it literally says, May that thought never be born in your mind. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? May that thought never be born in your mind. How, should, how can we, who died to sin, continue to live in sin? Is what he says. With our redemption and our adoption as sons, we have forgiveness. That means that God relinquishes His right to punish us for repentant sin. So, here's a question. Do you have difficulty forgiving? Do you have a hard time relinquishing your right to punish? of seeking out a pound of flesh. If you do, and we all do struggle with this, remember, remember what God forgave on your behalf. It's far worse than anything somebody here can do. God forgives us. Is that a blessing? We're still set in context. Another blessing before we get into our, the verses that, that I want to look at is God revealing the mystery of His will in the final dispensation. Yes, Paul was dispensational. And if you want to talk to me about that, I'm up for it. <laughs> It points directly to the millennial kingdom, which is what Paul calls the fullness of the times in Christ. God has sovereignly controlled all previous dispensations. And so I'm confident that he's capable to take care of the one that we're in, and he's conf I'm confident that he's capable of taking care of the next one to come, which... I believe, is the millennial kingdom. Would you call out a blessing? I would too. Here's what this points to. All of this, all of this points to one thing. It proves that salvation is all of God. Completely all of God. We have nothing to do with it. 
Would you call that a blessing? Me too. That sets the context. That's a lot of blessings bestowed on wretches like us, sinful creatures. But it doesn't stop there. There's more. Look at verses 11 and 12. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. Just a key gr- grammatical thing here. A key grammatical element. When God, when the scripture speaks of God in these verses, it's spoken in the active, it, and, and that means that he's the one that's doing it. When it speaks of us, the recipients, it's spoken of in the passive. We're, recipri- we're recipients. We're beneficiaries. It's done to us and for us. We are predestined. We are redeemed. We are adopted. We are forgiven. These are all things that are done to us and for us. We are given an inheritance. Something that simple, once again, just that little active and passive thing shows us that salvation is all of God. We're just recipients. So, how many people here have made out a will for when you die? You're going to die, okay? 100% mortality rate, just so you know. (laughs) You're going to die. We, when we make a will... We, we take inventory of everything that we own, and we decide who gets it and when, you know, who gets it when we die. And we ask people, do you want this? Do you guys want that? What do you want? Those kind of things. And um, that's called an inheritance, which becomes the next person's personal possession. It's theirs. It's not ours anymore. No U-Hauls following behind hearses. Doesn't happen. But often a will is not carried out as we intended and as we prescribed. Which means you've got to have a good executor. And even then, it may not work. Because lawyers will find loopholes for disgruntled relatives. I wanted dad's this. I wanted dad's that. Tough. (laughs) I'm my dad's executor. When my siblings come and say they want it, I'm going to tell them, tough. I'm doing what Dad said, that's it. People will manipulate. They'll, they'll try and get what they wanted. On top of that, executors don't follow the rules, and they'll give in to partiality or to those who maybe might throw a fit or something like that. And sometimes it becomes ugly It becomes a mess. It can ruin families. You know why? Because people are thinking about themselves instead of others. These verses, verses 11 and 12, show us that we have been given an inheritance from God. That word inheritance is the Greek word klerao. It's to be appointed something. It's to be given an allotment of something. It is an inheritance. It's a private possession. There's a big difference between getting an, between an inheritance from family and getting an inheritance from God. First of all, we're the ones that have to die in order to get the inheritance, not the other way around. Although Christ did die to give us the inheritance. And second of all, God's will is set in stone. You can't change it. 
no matter how you try. I want you to turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in order to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Notice the similarities here. God's blessed. God caused us to be saved. Complete salvation is revealed in the final dispensation. And we have an inheritance. And Peter tells us four things about that inheritance. He says it's imperishable. And that means that it cannot be destroyed or corrupted or lost. It's perfect, guarded by Christ. It's guarded by God in Christ. He says it's imperishable. He says it's undefiled. Unstained by anything that can be evil. Unpolluted by sin. God keeps all of that out by His holiness and sovereign power. It won't fade away. It's completely unaffected by the passage of time. And it's reserved. And when he says it's reserved, it, it means it's guarded and protected by God Himself for us. This is pretty cool. God's pretty cool. In fact, he's more than pretty cool. He is cool. We have reservations. <laughs> we have reservations in heaven at a place that we've never been to before. We have reservations that were made for us before he even created anything. You have reservations. If your name's written in the book of life, if you've come to Christ, if you've looked at this life, if you've looked at your life and, 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 and said, this isn't, this is messed up. The world's messed up. I'm a sinner. Christ came, paid the penalty for sin on that cross rose from the dead to prove that God accepted it and asks us. He calls us to come. Will you come? Will you become an adopted child if you haven't yet? Will you come and get all that's Christ's? I'm appealing to your humanness. Will you come and enjoy everything that heaven has to offer? Or will you stay where you're at? If you stay where you're at, everything you get in this life is the best it's ever going to be. Because once you're gone, there's no turning back. And it's the worst thing you can even imagine. I beg you to come. We have reservations that God made for us. And on top of that, He and He alone, the perfect one, is the executor of our inheritance. Think about it. God has promised us everything that Christ has as an inheritance. Those little words, and Christo, in Christ are so important 
Because we're in Christ, and, and since we're in Christ, everything that He has is ours. Everything that He has is ours. And even though we don't possess it practically yet, some of it, I haven't been glorified yet. I don't know if y'all have yet, but I haven't. <clears throat> but I am positionally glorified in Christ. The faithful God who cannot lie, who cannot renege on a promise, will never fail in his charge of this inheritance. He's promised it. We have God's, we have Christ's promises. We have Christ's kingdom. We have glorification. Everything that's Christ's is ours as an inheritance. He's the executor. How can he do that? Well, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says that we have an inherit we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of His will. We've been predestined according to God's predetermined purpose, foreordained by election. Election has to, We have to start with election because it's the foundation of it. Who works all things, all things, after the counsel of His will. God chooses, He predetermines it, and he doesn't change his mind. Notice this. All things happen according to God's predetermined plan. All things are foreordained. And all things means all things. Even down to the minute details. Both good and bad. That ruffles our self-reliant feathers. We don't mind God's providence in the good stuff. But when it comes to the bad stuff, I don't know about him predetermining that. <laughs> well, let me pose a couple questions. Is God all-knowing? Yes. In everything? Yes. Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? How can He know everything? Because He determined everything. Because He's eternal. He's not bound by time. Everything to God is an eternal now. There is no past. There is no future. Everything is a now to God. We can't even think that way because everything that we do, all the words that we speak are done in time. We're linear. God lives outside of that. He knows it all. Does God ever learn? No. Does He ever say, Whoop, Daniel, Caught me off guard that time. Never saw that coming. He doesn't say that. Did God create and then just sit back and watch to see how things work themselves out? No. Well, if he doesn't learn, then does it mean that everything's already determined? even to the most minute detail? Think in God's terms, not yours. K. 
Can anyone stop God's will? If you think you can stop God's will, the first thing I want you to do is read Jonah. Okay? Then come back and talk. Jonah tried and failed. If God allows something, does it mean it was in his planned will? Yes. If God doesn't allow something, does it mean it wasn't in his planned will? Yes. Well, I wanted to marry that girl, but it didn't happen. It was in God's planned will. When, God, when good things happen, do we have a problem saying it's part of God's plan? Wow, that was a great thing, God. You, I'm so glad that was part of your plan. Does it work the same way when bad things happen? It does. Why did this person have to die? I wasn't ready for that. It's part of God's plan. We can't have our cake and eat it too. James says, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when, not if, when you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. God's plan involves trials so that we can become stronger. That same sovereign God who is in control of all things has decided by His predetermined will that we will get an inheritance that He has promised. No loopholes. No executor failure. No manipulative fits. No ugly mess in the family. It's protected. It's promised by the sovereign, almighty God. Does that bless your soul? So why do we receive such a great inheritance? Why? Is it because we're worthy of it? No. Perhaps I get this inheritance because I was born with red hair, which would be a pretty good reason to get it. I mean, I, I know it's diminishing, but uh, it's still red. I have half the superpowers I had when I was younger. It's not because we're worthy. Is it because we're lovable? No. Is it because we, we've earned it and He owes us something? No. Is it to glorify God? Yeah. You got it. Verse 12. To the end, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Now, the we here is speaking of the apostles who were the first to believe. Paul's talking about the apostles there. But the inheritance extends to all saints who followed them, and that's what Peter talks about in the passage that we, talk, that we read just a little while ago. The bottom line is this. The purpose of everything, everything, is to bring glory and honor to God. Therefore, the predetermined plan of God was to bring glory to Himself. If it, was, if it were left up to us in any way, shape, or form, there'd be huge gaps in the glorification of God. We have glorious inheritance awaiting us. If we wrap our mind around that, instead of all of the things that go on in life, even today, you know what's going to happen? We're going to walk out of here, things are going to happen, and it's going to detract, it's going to distract us and turn our minds away from, from, 
from this to things that are happening, and it's, it's the enemy's way of getting us distracted. But when things happen, even today, think of the inheritance. Think of the blessings that we have in God. Think of those things, and it'll encourage your life all the way through. We have a glorious inheritance waiting for us. Are you looking forward to that inheritance? Because I am totally looking forward to it. We should be humbly grateful for it. We should be living like we appreciate it. We should be bringing glory to God because of it. If we keep our focus on the blessings of heaven, we won't lose heart in the day-to-day battles. And they're everywhere. So, I won't preach as long as Ken. I'll leave it like this. Let's give God the glory He is due by recognizing His total sovereignty in all things and thank Him for such great blessings in Christ. Amen? Amen. Lord, thanks. Thank You for the blessings that You've given to us. Thank You that you've turned undeserving people like us into blood-bought saints. We praise you. We ask that we can walk in your ways and that you'll keep us. That you'll keep us walking that way. And when we falter, Holy Spirit, turn our minds back to it, please, that we may glorify you in everything that we do. Amen.